Well, good morning, Cross Point. So, uh, <laughs> my name is Jeff. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet a lot of you, and uh, I used to have a job around here doing something, so it's great to be back this morning. Kayak uh, released a, a survey uh, just a few months ago about uh, travel habits and what people thought was appropriate and inappropriate in airports and on airplanes. I don't know how uh, scientific their study was. Some of their uh, results caused me to question that. But here were some of their do's and don'ts when you're flying. If you're yet to travel this summer or this year, you might keep these in mind. Uh, according to their survey, 57% of travelers believe you are not allowed to claim both armrests. Amen. <laughs> Everybody should get one. Come on. 92% of travelers agree you are not allowed to clip your nails. Who are the other 8% that think that's okay? 72% say you are allowed to bring cremated remains on board, just don't open the bag. I don't want to know if you do that. But here's the one that I questioned this whole survey. In their survey, 88% think it is okay to recline your seat. Obviously, they surveyed no one over six foot tall. We already don't have any leg room, and when you recline your seat, I don't need your seat in my lap. See, some of you must, you think that's okay, don't you, to recline your seat? Well, the next time, would you at least look behind you and see how tall the guy or, or person behind you is before you do that? But here's the thing about all of those. We view all of those through our lens of what is best for me. In fact, we make all kinds of choices in life based on what is best for me or what is convenient for me or what is easiest for me or what will help me climb the ladder or at least what is at least not inconvenient for me. As we uh, continue to work our way today through the book of Exodus and we look at the life of Pharaoh, we're going to see that in Pharaoh, he is incredibly self-centered. And his self-centeredness has a dramatic impact on the way that he interacts with God. So here, here's our, where we've been so far, as Matt and Ben have uh, taught these last few weeks. We have identified that the nation of Israel, the Israelites, are being held in captivity in Egypt. We'll see today they've been there for 430 years in captivity They've suffered genocide and persecution. It is a terrible situation. And so now God has raised up a leader named Moses as the person who will lead them out of this slavery, who will deliver them from this slavery. He's given him a companion, Aaron, and he's begun to equip him with the tools that he'll need to confront Pharaoh. And as Ben taught last week, they, they've had that initial confrontation, and now God's given him a tool to use to try to convince Pharaoh to let his people go. And then in beginning in chapters 5 through 12, in many ways, Pharaoh becomes one of the central characters of this story. And while there are plenty of things to dislike, and as Matt mentioned these first couple of weeks of this series, that Pharaoh is an extremely evil leader. And today, while I'm not suggesting that any of us have that kind of evil in us, we're not being honest with ourselves if we don't see a little bit of ourselves in Pharaoh and his self-centeredness. And just like Pharaoh, our self-centeredness sometimes impacts the way that we interact with God. So I've been... Uh, I'm supposed to focus today on chapters 7 through 12 and cover all 10 plagues in the next 30 minutes. Thanks, Matt. I mean, no, no problem, right, to cover all of that territory in these few minutes. But before we jump into chapter 7, there is a question back in chapter 5 that Pharaoh asked of God, really. And I think every one of the 10 plagues that we're going to mention today is God's answer to this question that, Moses, that Pharaoh asked. Here's the question. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord God of Israel say, says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. 
Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? Who's God that I should obey him? See, he asked a very modern question. It's a question we actually seem to ask all the times in our life. Who is God that I should obey him? Who is God that I shouldn't tell this lie? Who is God that I should obey his command to not have sex outside of marriage? Who is God that I should trust him when he tells me to be connected in community with other people? Who is God that I should obey him when he says not to gossip? Who is God that I should trust him and practice tithing in my life? Who is God that I should obey him? Why should I trust him? And you know what? We are good with God as long as he doesn't meddle in certain spaces of our lives. But when he tells us what to do in certain parts of our lives, we ask this question. Who is God that I should obey him? Well, God is about to answer that question for Pharaoh in some very dramatic ways. And really, after God begins to answer these questions, there's a new question that we ought to ask of Pharaoh. And really, this is a question we probably ought to ask of ourselves. How many times does God have to speak or act before I respond? How many times? What does God have to do to get my attention? How many times does he have to speak or act before I will finally recognize his authority in my life? Well, as we move into chapter 7, at the beginning of the chapter, Aaron and Moses go to Pharaoh and they use what Ben talked about last week. They take the staff with them and he throws it down and it becomes a snake and they pick it back up and that whole scene, and Pharaoh is unfazed by it. And so God begins to put 10 plagues on the nation of Egypt. Here's the first one and how it's described in chapter 7, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river, confront him on the bank of the Nile, and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. Right? Who is God that I should listen to him? Who's God that I should obey him? He's about to show him. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink, and the Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. And God does exactly what he promises. He turns the water into blood. It is not drinkable. It stinks, the fish die. It is a difficult situation. And yet, Pharaoh seems unmoved by it. And we have to ask, how many times? And the answer, obviously, at this point is at least one more time. And so God sends another plague. Exodus chapter 8 begins to describe it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and and your bedroom and onto your bed and into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all of your officials. There are frogs everywhere. This would be Matt's greatest nightmare in life. (laughs) I know he's mentioned it before, he doesn't like frogs. I'm here to tell you today, because he gave me so much scripture to cover, I'm here to tell you today, he's not just a little bit afraid of them, he's ridiculously afraid of them. I think it was some kind of failure in our parenting somehow that he is so afraid of frogs. So these frogs are everywhere, but again, Pharaoh is not moved. And we ask, how many times 
Does God have to speak or act before he will respond? And so that follows nine. There's then several more plagues that begin to happen. One is gnats, or some have translated this as lice that crawl into their nostrils and their ears and embed themselves, followed by insects, which most uh, would translate this as flies, and it describes that they're everywhere, like you can't walk on the ground without stepping on these flies. But, but here's something interesting from this point on. God starts with this plague, and it's now just on the Egyptians. Where the Egyptians are, there are flies everywhere, but just over the way where the Israelites live, no flies. God begins to make a distinction. Then the flies are followed by livestock dying. Their livestock begins to die. And this is not just, oh, we won't have any bacon for breakfast in the morning or any steaks to eat tonight. This was their livelihood. So much of their income was derived from this livestock that was now dying in this plague. That's followed by boils on the Egyptian skin, the only plague that seems to personally affect them, their bodies. These painful boils come on them. That's followed by hail, and it's described there that it's a massive storm. There is lightning and giant hail that, that crushes their plants and shreds their trees. I mean, Jim Cantor would have been there <laughs> to cover it. It was devastating. And that's followed by locusts who wipe out the rest of their crops. You can look up Vegas, Las Vegas in 2019. They had locusts everywhere. It probably was worse than the pictures you'll see there. And then that is followed by darkness. And not just, oh, it got dark at night. This is darkness like in a cave where you can't see your hand in front of your face. And yet God, and his, this is only God can do this kind of stuff. This darkness pervades where the Egyptians are, but like just across the street, just down the way, the Israelites have light. And how does God do that? I don't know. Only God can do these kinds of things, but he brings darkness on them. Nine devastating plagues. And still, Pharaoh is not willing to acknowledge God's authority and obey him. Now, what keeps him from being willing to obey God? What keeps him from acknowledging God's authority? How many times does God have to speak or act? Well, I think there are several reasons in Pharaoh's life that keep him from being willing to obey God. And friends, here's what I want us to see this morning. I think sometimes some of these are the same reasons that we struggle to recognize God's authority over our lives. Let, let me show you what I'm talking about. If we go back to the plague of the blood, the very beginning in Exodus chapter 7, we read this, the fish in the Nile died and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. Then get this part. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart became hard because he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to heart. Somehow, Pharaoh's magicians were able to duplicate this plague. And I, again, I can't explain that. I think the power of Satan is somehow involved in him being, them being able to duplicate this. I can't explain it exactly, but they duplicate it. Here's what I began to think about as I was studying for today. God had already sent this plague of blood. The water in Egypt had already turned to blood. It was nasty. It, it stunk. The fish were dead. It was already a bad situation. So what possesses these magicians and Pharaoh to say, hey, let's take this situation that's already really bad and let's duplicate it and make it even worse? I mean, how ignorant. All because they had a desire to somehow prove that they were equal with God. Friends, I think sometimes we do the same ignorant thing in our lives. And it's one of the reasons that we struggle to obey God. We act as though I'm God's equal. 
Now, we would never be as blatant as Pharaoh and his magicians, but friends, we find ourselves in difficult situations, and rather than just trusting God and listening to him, we grab hold of the situation ourselves, we think we can take care of it, and we try to fix it on our own, and how often do we just make matters worse because we try to fix it ourselves? It's like me and plumbing. Like, especially when we owned our house in Cape Coral, <laughs> I would think at times, oh, I could fix this. It doesn't seem like a big deal. You know, I'll just watch a, a video on YouTube or I'll read something. I mean, if the plumber can do it, certainly I, I could fix it too. And I'd get into it and I would always just make it worse. I could end up costing me way more money probably to get it fixed in the long run because I messed it up. I made a bad situation even worse. And somehow it seems like in our lives we behave as though we think we are smarter than God. Oh, I can figure it out all by myself, God. But we just make matters worse. It's as though we say, hey, God, I, I know what you're saying, but you know, if I do that, it just doesn't seem like a good financial decision. Or God, I, I hear what you say in the Bible, but if I do that, then people will think I'm some kind of weirdo. God, how about I, how about I do it this way? How about I do it my way? Who's God that I should obey him? But how many times does God have to speak or act before I will recognize that I am in no way equal with God? I am not as smart as God, and I ought to always trust him first. Not after I've tried to figure it out by myself. Then let me remind you again of what happens with the plague of the frogs in Exodus 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land. Now here's what's interesting about this. Most scholars believe that every one of the plagues was to confront one of the 114 gods, little g, that the Egyptians worshiped. Right? One of those gods was Heket, the frog god. I've got a picture here for you. Right? Ridiculous. They worshiped this god. And I think the plague of the frogs was God's answer to say, you know what, the one who actually created the frogs is greater than your false god. See, friends, here's the reality for us. One of the reasons that we sometimes struggle to obey God is we've got other gods. We've got other gods. We've got other things in our lives that we have decided are more important to us than God is. We've decided that based on how we spend our time, our resources, what kind of attention we give to it, how much we focus on it. We've made it more important in our lives than God. It's become another God to us. One of the other gods that the Egyptians worshipped was a god named Happy. Right? It, they believed this god gave them fulfillment in life. This god was the source of the good life, thus the name. And you know what? I think it's a basic human instinct for all of us that we want to we find the good life. We want to experience the happy life. That's why we have all the commercials that we do. Like Verbo, right? They advertise now that you can, you can have the whole house to yourself and you can bring your whole family with you and be in one of these wonderful places and you'll have the good life together. Or Marriott advertises they have all these hotels and all these amazing places all around the world and you can go ahead and have this wonderful experience in one of their hotels. Or the silly commercials that Corona has where the three guys are having stupid conversations on the beach. But what you're supposed to think is, look, if I drink that, then I'll, I'll have the good life. Remember the old commercial some time ago with that Matthew McConaughey where he was driving the Lincoln? Oh, yeah, like it, it was the good life, right? If you have this luxury automobile, it's the good life. Or, or all of the Coke commercials that so much of them are about community and you'll hang out with your other friends and we'll drink a Coke together. Right? We all want to experience gladness and joy and happiness and community and good food. We want the happy life. But what happens when our, our pursuit of the happy life comes up against what God says and what God says is a bit different? 
And it's just a natural human instinct, though. We want, we want that happy life. But so often when we come up against them, we have to make a choice between what God says and the pursuit of this happy life, which for us, pursuing this happy life, we, we figured out that we can pursue that by climbing the ladder or accumulating wealth or burying our pain in some kind of addiction or substance or satisfying our sexual desires or thinking we'll get our kids everything they need so that somehow they can get ahead in life. And when our desire for the happy life comes up against something that God desires for us, how often do we choose the happy life over what God says? Because we've made the happy life a God in our life. You've all seen the, probably the quote from Tom Brady, NFL quarterback who's retired now. Thank goodness. And, uh, you know, he, he, he's like won all these Super Bowls, and so after he'd won yet another Super Bowl, and, and he's got all this money, and he can go anywhere and do anything, and at this time when he said this, he was married to a beautiful woman, had a great family. I mean, the only thing wrong in his whole life was that he picked the wrong college to go to. Other than that, he had this like wonderful life, and he, he says, he, this is his quote, he said, I was sitting on the bed after winning one of those Super Bowls, and I thought to myself, is this it? Is this it? Is this all there is? Jesus promised when he was teaching one day that I have come to give them a rich and satisfying life. Right? God wants us to come to understand that the hungriest part of our heart can only be fulfilled by him. I wonder this morning, if God were going to send a plague into your life today, to confront some false God, something in your life that you have made more important than God, what false God would he need to come after in your life? What thing, what person have you made more important than God that he needs to confront you about? And how many times will God have to speak or act before I come to realize that only he can bring true fulfillment in my life. I don't need any other gods. I just need to trust him as my heavenly father. Then I think there's one other thing that I want to point out that causes Pharaoh to have this unyielding or hard heart that's repeated over and over and over again throughout these chapters. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 8 and yet another one of the plagues. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials and your people and into your houses and the houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen where the Israelites live. Where my people live, no swarms of flies will be there so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land and I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. Now, remember, God has said to Moses and Moses has repeated to Pharaoh that Pharaoh is to let his people go, let them go into the wilderness, a three-day journey and worship him there. Look what Pharaoh says next. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Moses said, that would not be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? We must take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God as he commands us. Right? God has said, go a three-day journey and let them worship me there. See, here, here's one of the other reasons that we seem to sometimes struggle to obey God. We've got a counteroffer. And that's what Pharaoh does here, right? God said, go, let him go three days journey. Pharaoh says, okay, how about this, God? They can worship you, but they just do it right here in the land. He treats God as if he's buying a used car. Hey, I know the sticker price says 15000 How about I give you twelve five? But God is not a used car salesman, and he's not interested in making bargains or hearing your counteroffer. He just expects us to recognize his authority in our life and obey him. 
And here's what this looks like in our lives so often in a number of different ways. We often want to bargain with God over sin. God, it's just a white lie. Isn't that okay? God, I'm just looking at some pictures on the internet. Isn't that okay? God, I know I have a temper, but man, that's just the way I am. Isn't that okay? And we want to bargain over sin. Sometimes we want to bargain with God over his plans for our life. God, I want to to follow you, but man, don't ask me to go there. God, don't ask me to share Jesus with my friends at work. God, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to really fully become like Jesus. We want to bargain over his plans. Or, Or sometimes we want to bargain with God over our circumstances. I mean, when everything's going good, we, we're praising God, and we talk about all his blessings in our lives, but then when things get difficult, we get mad at God, we get angry, we blame him, we think he's unfair. You know, we'll praise God if all the planes today stay, that are in the sky, land safely, but let one of them fall out of the sky, and we say, where was God? Why is he such a cruel, unfair God? How many times? Does God have to speak or act before we realize that he doesn't want to bargain with us? How many times does he have to speak or act before we will just recognize his authority and submit our will to his? Well, they go through all of these plagues and Pharaoh's heart is unmoved. Right, and we read through all this and we, we ask, right, how many times? How many times does God have to act before Pharaoh will quit saying, who is God that I should obey him? Well, as you move on into the latter parts of 11, chapters 11 and 12, we come to the 10th and final plague. God does not give a warning to Pharaoh about this plague, but he does warn his own people, the Israelites, God sends Moses, and Moses warns them that you need to sacrifice a lamb. You need to take some of the blood from that lamb and put it over your door frame and on the side posts of the door frame. Then you need to prepare a special meal, including the meat of that lamb, a meal that would later become known as the Passover meal. And Moses warned them that about midnight— the death angel was going to come. I don't know if this is the original place where parents began to say nothing good happens after midnight, but maybe. And Moses warns them that after midnight, the death angel is coming. And the death angel is going to take the life of the firstborn of every one of the Egyptians. But as long as they have sacrificed the lamb and put the blood on the doorframe of their house, the past, this death angel will pass over their homes, the Israelites, and they will be spared. And here's what happens. Exodus chapter 12. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. Friends, for the Egyptians, this was a horrific night. There is no glossing over what their disregard for God and their disobedience led to. But for the Israelites, this was a night they would never forget for a far different reason. Because of their obedience and humbly following the one true God. Their slavery, their persecution, the genocide, the injustice was about to come to an end because they followed a God filled with compassion, a promise-keeping, loving, powerful God. And for them, 430 years of captivity was about to come to an end. Because God had acted. And what happened that night? 
would for us become a foreshadowing of our deliverance from sin. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, followers of Jesus just like us, wrote, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood in our place so that we could be delivered from our sin. And a hundred or so years after the Israelites were delivered from captivity and hundreds of years before Jesus would come, Isaiah wrote these words promising what would happen. But he, meaning Jesus, was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He made the sacrifice for us. I know I've told this story before. I've told it at camp. But I want to remind you of this story today. For so for some of you, it's just a reminder of this story because I think it ties what happens in Exodus with what Jesus does for us so clearly. Uh, for years, I uh, served, in a, when we, Peg and I lived in Ohio, I served, and Peg actually, we did it together initially. We served at a middle school week of camp. Peg likes middle school kids. Me, maybe not quite so much. Sorry. And uh, one day during camp, they would bring a lamb. Local farmer would bring a lamb by and kind of tie it up outside where the kids would be passing by all day and they would begin to interact with it. They'd pet it, they'd talk to it. Some of them would name it. That night, we took all the kids out to a, a field and uh, had it all set up with some chairs there and had built a stone altar in the front. And some guys act, acting dressed in Old Testament garb came out carrying that lamb. The same lamb the kids had played with all day, they'd gotten a little attached to, they'd named it. And they took that lamb and they'd place it on that altar. And they'd talk about this lamb being the sacrifice for sins. And then he would pull out a long knife and he'd raise that knife high in the air as though he was going to slaughter that lamb and sacrifice it. And the kids would respond and gasp and they couldn't believe it. Sometimes there were tears. But just as he would begin to lower that knife, a loud voice from behind everyone would holler, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And everyone would turn. And there and just in the distance, with someone portraying Jesus hanging on the cross. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The one who delivers us from our Egypt, from our sin. Friends, if you've not yet, if you're in this room today and you've not yet made a decision to follow Jesus and to publicly declare your desire to follow him by being baptized, then please don't leave today without making that decision. He's the only Savior. He's the only source of forgiveness. He's the only hope. He's the only way our sins can be forgiven. But he died on the cross so that you could have that gift of salvation, so he could be your sacrificial lamb. Some of us will be down here at the front at the end of the service. We'd love to talk with you about how you could make that decision. Friends, for the rest of us, he's our Savior. And this week, as we go through life and we find ourselves in those moments where we're wrestling between going our way and doing what God says, listen, don't fool yourself into thinking that you are somehow equal with God. We are not. Don't think that you can bargain with God. You can't. Don't allow yourself to put other things more important to God and make them gods in your life. Ask yourself, how many times does God have to speak or act? before I will recognize his authority in my life and trust him. What more does God have to do than sacrifice his only son on the cross for me? Who is God that I should obey him? Well, he's the savior. What more does he have to do? Would you pray with me? God, would you help us to recognize your authority in our life? 
God, would you help us to submit our will to yours? Because God, if we're honest this morning, all, all of us in our hearts, we, we have a tendency towards self-centeredness. We want to make life about me and what's easiest, and God, it gets us off of the track sometimes. Oh God, I, I ask today for forgiveness even this week when, I, when I've done that, when I've, rather than listening to you, gone my own way. God, I, I pray that for everyone in this room. Father, there are some here today maybe who have never said yes to Jesus as their Savior. I pray, God, you'd work in their heart right now in this moment so that they'd know they shouldn't leave this place without saying yes to you and beginning to follow, and they'd have that conversation with someone today. God, help us to submit our will to yours. Help us to submit to recognize your authority. Remind us, God, every day this week, who is God that I should obey him? Well, he's my savior. And what more do I need? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.